Hare Krishna. So thank you for coming today evening. And today I will speak on one of the most uh, volatile and controversial aspects of the Ramayana. That is Ram's sending away of Sita. And <clears throat> I'll talk some broad principles and I'll use an acronym uh, which will be the center of the class. So, if we consider education in general, education has two aspects to it. One is that we learn what is right, what is true, what is correct. And the other is we unlearn what is wrong. So learning and unlearning need to go in parallel. And unlearning is in some way painful. Because we all have certain conceptions. And whether we know it or not, we develop attachment to our conceptions. In fact, some people, they are so attached to their opinions. They say, if there is an argument, they say, I can agree with you, but then both of us will be wrong. <laughs> so they are so confident that they are right, that it is very difficult to have a discussion with them. So generally, when we are in the, uh, generally we think of, think, of, think of attachments in terms of, to positions, to things, but there can be attachment to opinions also. And generally when we are in the mode of passion, we have very strong attachment to positions. In the mode of goodness, we have very strong attachment to opinions. So whenever education is there, actually there are some opinions, some conceptions that need to die. And that's, that's painful. So there is a, you could say, when a deep conversation is happening, there is continuous death and reincarnation of our conceptions. Oh, I was thinking like this, but this has changed, now it's like this. And death is painful. And when a, so when a soul dies, at that time the soul remains very attached to the particular body. Then the soul cannot go to the next body. And the soul becomes a ghost. So similarly, sometimes, when we are very strongly attached to an opinion, we don't give up that opinion and we don't evolve to a higher understanding. So when we study scripture, scripture teaches us in some ways where it is gradually lifting us up. Okay, you had this understanding now, you don't have this understanding. But sometimes scripture jolts us. And for that purpose, say if we have a property, there is already something constructed when you bought the property. Now some things we might build up on what has been constructed. And some places we might have to bulldoze what is there and then reconstruct again. So similarly in scripture, there are many things which build up on our existing understanding. Say for example, we should be dutiful, we should be kind, we should be truthful. All these are virtues which learn in our day to day lives also. But, and scripture also gives us stories and examples of how to teach these virtues, how to live these virtues, why to live these virtues. So this is where scripture builds on our existing conceptions. But sometimes scripture destroys our existing conceptions to build something new. Just like say sometimes in the property where we have, we might have to bulldoze the existing property to build something new. So we see it is happening in the Bhagavad Gita also, where normally we would think that God would be a person who would deter people from war, who would ask people to solve things amicably, peacefully. But in that particular situation, Krishna asks Arjun to fight a war. Of course, Krishna's primary message is not that to fight a war, Krishna's primary message is to establish dharma and do what it takes to establish dharma. In that context, it is fighting a war against one's own elders. This is quite jolting and disorienting actually. So to understand, we need to be willing to have 
our understanding is questioned. So when a new understanding is building on our existing understanding, it is easy. But when a new understanding challenges our existing understanding, not only challenges, but it destroys our existing understanding, it is much more difficult. So most of the Ramayana builds on our existing understanding. If we live in a broadly sattvic uh, way of living, we, we live in a cultured way, yes, it, we should take care of our family. Yes, how Ram selflessly gives up his property for the sake of his family. Okay, I don't want conflict in my family, I'll go to the forest. Then how Bharat, although he's got that property, he doesn't hold on to the property, he wants to give it back to his father. He brother, he wants to do what is right. So we see that <coughs> our understanding of what is right and wrong, that is itself demonstrated in an extraordinarily sublime way. We all know that we shouldn't grab what is others, but who would really want to go and give back something which they already got of their own accord and beg the brother to do that. So th there is much in the Ramayana which builds on our existing understanding. <coughs> but there are some incidents in the Ramayana which primary focus on destroying our existing understanding to build something new. And those need to be very carefully understood. So one such incident is uh, which happens towards the end of the Ramayana. In some ways you could say the Ramayana is like a typical romance story. There is a hero, there is a heroine and the hero heroically wins the hand of the heroine and the villain comes into the picture and the villain takes away the heroine and the hero and the, hero, hero and the villain have a great war and then the hero defeats the villain and the hero and the hero unite and then they live happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we would expect. But just when they were supposed to live happily ever after, they get separated. What happened? It's like say we go to a movie and we, f we think this is a like a rom rom -com, romantic comedy movie. And then towards the end it turns out to be a tragedy. What happened? You know, we go with a different frame if you know it's a movie is a tragedy or a movie is a romantic movie. So the Rama and for the most of the time follows the trajectory of <coughs> of uh, a typical building up on the values that we know. A typical story which is very adventurous, romantic, intriguing, in some ways filled with uh, fantastic idea, fantastic beings. So it's very captivating. But the conclusion can be very jolting. That when Ram and Sita were united, living happily in the forest, then at, uh, at, in their kingdom, then there was an asper aspersion cast on Sita. That because she had been with Ravan for one full year, so, <coughs> so she had become contaminated. And this rumor spread so much that Ram, in response to that rumor, decided to send Sita away to the forest. And he had Lakshman carry her away. And on top of that, as if that were not bad enough, Sita was pregnant at that time. So, one thing we can be sure, the, the scripture is not written by anyone who was concerned about not offending people's ideas. Scripture, Ramayana is not written by some author concerned about political correctness. This, this, now, this would be considered outrageous even by normal human standards. How can a man on an unsubstantiated accusation abandon his wife he, all the more so when she is pregnant? If you would consider such a person as not even a normal decent human being. And now we could use this to consider, say that oh, this whole Ramayana and this whole story, Ram story is perverse. People, people have no sense of moral values. But if we look at it a little more in a broader context, we see Ram does have a strong sense of moral values. That's why he was ready to sacrifice his kingdom for the sake of the father. And we, should, we shouldn't think that 
वी आर द रामायण हैज बीन अडोर्ड फॉर मिलेनिया नाउ एंड इज इट जस्ट सिंपली द बेनिफिट ऑफ डाउट इफ यू टू गिव वेर ऑल द अकॉर्डिंग टू सम हिस्टोरियंस दैट नो अदर बुक इन द वर्ल्ड which has inspired so many people for so long the bible has of course been there the ramayana is older than the bible and it has inspired so many people <coughs> so you like quarter of the world's population for millennia so is it simply speaking that where all the people who respected the ramayana and were inspired were all of them fools if we are to think like that we need to think again we we say now technology has progressed a lot and we are we are now very advanced okay fine but you take that same reasoning and look at the past even if you look from the modern historical perspective life was much tougher in the past you now in the sense that people there were we didn't have the technology to deal with natural storms there were predator animals there so many diseases so people in the past survived through it all and to survive in life is not easy so surely those people had some intelligence so we could at least <coughs> give the benefit of doubt and consider that i am not the first person who suddenly has realized hey this is crazy <coughs> there must be other people also have thought of the something and instead of dismissing this we need to investigate this i will <coughs> I was in the Middle East at that time. One devotee showed me a WhatsApp message that had become viral over there. So there's some person uh, in India. What has happened that some people have thought, especially people in South India, they have that, that Ram is like a no, Ram is like a North Indian hero, and Ravan is a South Indian hero, <laughs> and they have put it like a uh, North Indian versus South Indian conflict. And in fact, there is something called a RPC. RPC is a Ravan Protection Committee. <laughs> <laughs> Now, <laughs> Ravan is he, nobody could protect him. Despite he had benedictions from Brahma and Shiva, still they couldn't protect him. But that is silly. So this this notice was this WhatsApp notification was that that actually, if I ever want a brother, I want a brother like Ravan. He was ready to die to protect Shurpan Khan's honor. and if i want a husband i never want a husband like ram cuz she was because he was ready to abandon his wife so now so that was there in the middle east they asked me to ask me to speak on this topic so i said okay if ravan was really such a great brother that he was ready to give up to fight for sita's honor for shurpan ka honor that's not really true actually it was when shurpan ka came and she showed her nose has been cut and he was dishonored he first initially was very angry and then he <clears throat> he said who's done this to you i will die and then she told actually this is ram now another of ravan general akampan had already come over there his name was akampan but when he came to the palace he was doing kampan <coughs> akampan is one who never trembles kampan is one who trembles so seeing ram's prowess he had become so scared that he told what had happened that ram had killed khar dushan and the whole regiment of rakshasas kept at janasthan on hearing this ravan was infuriated and then a company told him that ram is too powerful don't antagonize him and then he decided to calm down he decided not to antagonize but then when shurpan khan came and he heard that it's ram He immediately turned around. He said, "Did you attack her? Did he attack you first, or did you attack her first?" And he said, "You know, they were living in their area. You went and poked into their lines. So if they were attacked, it's your fault, not their fault." And he conveniently blamed her. How oh, sure Manka was furious, and then she just changed the whole story. Oh, my dear brother, you know why I had gone there. she had go actually gone there because she had been attracted to ram and she had even tried to attack sita because she felt sita was an obstacle for her to enjoy with ram but she turned the whole story around she said actually i saw 
Sita, she is so beautiful. And I feel that you are such a great hero and all the beautiful women in the world are meant for you. <laughs> so I went there to get Sita for you. But see, this is what Ram did to me. And then he started describing Sita's beauty. She, uh, she Surapanka is describing Sita's beauty. And as soon as that happened, then Ravan's intelligence started burning. And soon as the desire started growing, 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 what happened? Buddhi Nashat Pranashyati. His intelligence got destroyed. So, you know, today we have this whole industry you know, which incites people by um, presenting obscene images. So, you could call the whole pornography industry the Shurpanaka industry. You know, it, it, so, so Shurpanaka, when Ravan went, it was not because of his love for, love for Shurpanaka that he went to fight with Ram. He went because of his lust for Sita. So, in no way is Ram a Ravan an ideal brother. So, the, I told this is a side issue, but the point is, there are people who take this and distort it completely. But it's a valid question, why did Ram send Sita away like this? And when I read the Ramayana first, I was also shocked by it. And I, read, I heard the Ramayana way, 35, 40, when I, very early childhood I heard it. And for many years, I never had any satisfactory answer for this. Then I started studying and speaking and writing on the Ramayana. So for many years, I have now read, studied different commentaries, talked with different devotees or Ram scholars. And gradually, I have arrived at some understanding. And I'll summarize that in an acronym, SEES. S-E-E-S. SEES -E -E means one who sees with knowledge. The Shastra often contains the phrase, Yahapashyati sapashyati. One who sees in this way actually sees. So we don't really see just with our eyes. We see with the knowledge that we have. It's like somebody, a villager comes from us, uh, an uh, uh, person, a tribal or a village comes, has no idea of stock market. The person comes and sees a big, comes to the stock market and sees a big screen over there. And then a line goes down and everybody what happened? One line went down there. Why are you hyperventilating? No, they are hyperventilating because they are seeing with knowledge. So, S E E S. So, let us look at these. First S is <coughs> first S is sacrifice. So, you know, there was a so Ram, he yes, he suspected that uh, now he. If Ram had just been uh, like a judgmental husband who had just abandoned her wife, his wife, when uh, some aspersion had been cast on, cast on her. Mm. <coughs> so the first thing is, it was not just that Sita suffered by being sent away for Ram. Ram also suffered. Because Ram did not replace Sita. Ram did not, he was a... Some people say it was because of he was so concerned about his honor that he was concerned more about his honor than about his own wife also. If, it's, if, he, was simp if he had been simply concerned about honor, then if you want to have like a picture perfect family for the world to show, then a king without a queen is definitely not picture perfect. Ram uh, could easily have married again, but he did not marry again. So it is not just that he, 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 Sita suffered. Of course, you could say Sita suffered more because she was in the forest and Ram was in the royal palace. But still, Ram did not replace Sita. Leave alone replacing Sita when he had to perform sacrifices for which in the yajna, husband and wife have to do it together. That, that time the sages told him, the Brahmins told him, you need a wife for this, you have to marry. He said, no, I am not going to marry. And he had a golden statue of Sita made. And he had that seat next to her. Now, this indicates not only did he not reject Sita, but also he considered her pure enough to sit in sacrifice with him. So, that means as far as his personal uh, consideration is there, he did not reject Sita and he, did, he, he in fact rejected the accusation of impurity against her also. He considered her pure. So, in that sense, so the word sacrifice means 
it is not just a sacrifice for Sita, it is also a sacrifice for Ram. <coughs> there are several European kings, U British kings especially, when Europe was under the Catholic rule. So what would happen is, the Catholics are very strongly against divorce. And there was a particular king, I think George V or something, he was a infamously lusty person. So he would get attracted to many, many women. And because the church would not allow polygamy, and because the church would not allow divorce also. So what he did was, he would marry a woman, uh, enjoy with her, and when he would get tired, he would have a, her framed for adultery. And at adultery, that she had illicit relationship with someone. And at that time, the idea was if somebody is accused of adultery, they would be killed. So he would get killed and they would marry another woman. And he did like that for 10 women. So, you know, kings had brutal powers in the past. But if you see Ram, what to speak of, he, he did not even remarry. He lived a life of abstinence. So there are ghastly misuses of power that have done in the past. So Ram sacrificed. Yes, Sita sacrificed, Ram sacrificed. Now that may raise the question that, okay, if it was really that <coughs> Ram did not accept that Sita was impure, then why would, uh, why did he send her away at all? So that brings us, what acronym are we discussing? C. 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 So S we discussed was? Sacrifice. sacrifice. Now E is ethical dilemma. Ethical dilemma is, there is a difference between moral dilemma and ethical dilemma. Moral dilemma, dilemma is where, uh, there are two choices which are both, one is moral, the other is immoral. This is right, this is wrong. What will you do? So do the right thing requires some moral strength. But when you have two choices, both of them are right, then what do you do? Say for example, to speak truth is right, to protect someone's life is right. But suppose, say if there are terrorists who are chasing a, a friend of ours and that friend comes and knocks at our house and then please save me and we hide them in our basement or somewhere and then the terrorists come and knock on the door. Is this person here? Now what should we tell them? What do you think we should tell them? No. Not there. But aren't we lying? So should we lie? So here is where an ethical dilemma comes up. Ethical dilemma is that two options are right, then we have to say which is more right. And that's why <coughs> there is two view, there are two views of ethics. <coughs> One is contextual ethics and the other is categorical ethics. Categorical ethics means this is right and this is wrong. Everything that fills in this category is right. Everything that falls in this category is wrong. And that's all. There's no further discussion. So according to categorical ethics, if somebody, they ask you where is the terrorist, you should tell the truth. But contextual ethics means that we don't we recognize there are categories of right and wrong, but we also have to look at the context. And if the if in that context speaking the truth is going to lead to harm and terrible harm the death of a person, then by considering the consequence, we have to move speaking a lie from the wrong category to the right category. So categorical ethics are subtle and they require an understanding, sorry, contextual ethics are subtle because they require an understanding of time, place, circumstance. <coughs> and most people uh, if most people don't even think about ethics, yes, they live the way they want to live. But those who think about ethics, they often have this categorical understanding. But contextual means <coughs> that ethics, there is, uh, we have to look at the context to understand what is right and what is wrong. So the epics, the Ramayana and Mahabharata, they are spoken thousands and thousands of years ago. And the ethics in the, the context at that time is significantly different from ours. 
So what is the context in which Ram lived? The context was that a king is meant to set an example for all of society. And what example? The example is of dutifulness, of detachment. The king has, the, has more material wealth and power than everyone else. And yet this king is ready to give it all up or subordinate it all for the sake of dharma. Now one example of this is that the king is the wealthiest, strongest person but when the sages come to the for, to, from the forest, the king bows down to them, the king respects them, the king worships them. All the, so normally people don't look at, people, most people have material vision. This person is so, has a big, a big palace, must be a very big person. But they add, okay, sages, oh, these are just living in the forest. What do they have? They have nothing. So the king, by, despite having material opulence, when the king is detached enough to offer respect to the sages, what happens? The people start seeing, oh, the sages are also meant to be respected. What do the sages really have? Oh, they have spiritual knowledge. They have spiritual consciousness. They have spiritual attachment to God. That is valuable. So this is how people come to value it. So the king's duty was not just to provide for the material well-being of people. The king's duty was also to provide for their spiritual welfare. So as a part of this, the king is meant to be detached, uh, exemplify detachment. See, nowadays we see that in politics, especially in third world countries, there is what is called nepotism. Nepotism is where if one it's partiality towards one's relatives. You know, if one person becomes a minister, then the ministry becomes filled with 500 relatives of that person. <laughs> Isn't it? Everybody starts, everybody's uncle and grandson and great grandson and uncles, cousins, daughters, mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they also get plum positions. So there is the tendency within for those in power to abuse their power for their personal and familial uses. And Ram, he demonstrates detachment in an extraordinary way. So he had his duty as a king to demonstrate detachment and impartiality. And he also had his duty as a husband to protect his wife. Now among these two duties, which duty is more important? Is it duty as a king or duty as a duty as a, a husband? Now both duties are important. So for him the ethical dilemma was this or this. So whenever there is great power along with it, yes, along with it comes a great power bill. <laughs> Nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> great electricity bill. <laughs> but of course, along with great power comes great responsibility. So if you're taking some high post, you have to take responsibility for that. So in that particular situation, because Ram had been the king, then what did he do? He chose to focus on his duty as a king. And thus, he sent Sita away. Now we could say, sometimes it is said that Sita was exiled, Sita was banished. Well, you could say that, but it's not exactly the same as Ram was banished earlier. That was right into the forest where Ram had to, there was no kingdom, it was a wilderness, and Ram had to build his own cottage and live in the wilderness. But Ram sent Sita to near Valmiki's hermitage. And she went and lived in Valmiki's hermitage. So there were many, uh, many female mendicants also living over there, female ascetics. And she lived among them. It was definitely a difficult life. But still, Valmiki's hermitage was in Ram's kingdom. So indirectly, Sita was still under Ram's protection. The way any citizen would be in his protection. So in that sense, Ram did not literally banish Sita right into the forest outside her kingdom. So he chose his duty as a king. But he did not entirely abandon his duty as a husband. So what he showed to society is that, that I am not attached. If you think that it is only because of attachment to my wife that although she is accused of this, still I am staying on with her, it is not because of attachment.
So, he is demonstrating detachment over there. <coughs> now, any questions till now about this? So, I talked three broad points till now. First is how scripture sometimes teaches by uprooting our conceptions. Then I talked about S, that was sacrifice, and E was ethical dilemma. Any questions till now? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, that was the plan because La Ram told uh, Lakshman that he should take uh, Sita right next to Valmiki's hermitage and then from there she would go there and she would stay over there. So that was the plan. Yes, bro. You were saying that Ram did take care of Sita when she was in exile, but he didn't even know that Lakusha is his son when they were fighting. So, what kind of take care was Okay, I agree with you, that's true. He didn't know that she, basically the idea was that he cut off all contact with her. But she was in the kingdom. And the kingdom was overall protected. Now, the, the, it's not that the king will know all citizens personally. But if there is some intrusion, if there is some aggression, then the kingdom, the kingdom is protected, citizens are protected. So, in that sense, it is not like a personal protection, definitely not. That bond he did cut with her. The credibility of person who accused another Sita accused this guy yeah. who was doing it, I mean, was just showing his anger to his wife. Um, I don't know. So I was wondering why God had to lose. Okay, that's true. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so the washerman who, uh, who accused his wife, saying that I'm not like Ram. You know, so I am not going to accept you. So, his, his, what was his credibility that Ram had to take that accusation seriously? See, when the Ram's messengers came back, Ram's, Ram, the whole story is that Ram had sent his messengers to go in the kingdom and check how the citizens are. And they were very reluctant to tell what had happened. So, it was not just one person accusing, that, that from that one person it spread. See, generally, what I have seen is that when rumors start spreading, it's very, very difficult to choose one course of action. Because what happens, rumors are like fire. It's a few months ago, I think in California, there's a place called Paradise. You know, we just turned into hell. Because there's a big fire over there, everything got burned down. So one of my friends is a, is a firefighter. So he was telling me that when these fires, first fires come, you, know, it's, you, you cannot decide how to deal with it. Sometimes they just die a natural death, you neglect them. Sometimes they start spreading. And the more you try to counter them, the more they blaze more. Because you try to counter them, and if wind comes, they'll start blowing more. So, <coughs> sometimes we just have the, the fire is going to burn over here, we can't do anything. Let this area burn, at least let it stop it over there. So, rumors are like forest fires. And when they start spreading, there is no steady way of dealing with it. So, sometimes we just have to neglect the rumor and move on with our lives. Sometimes, you know, we may have to, the, the, the fire may be burning so much that we may ask them they have to move away. Because this sometimes, we try to, the more we try to counter a rumor, the bigger the rumor becomes. So, <coughs> in that situation, now Ram had already had the Agni Pariksha and Brahmaji himself had been there. So, if that Agni Pariksha Sita had already passed and there was no basis for that rumor, this is. But if still that rumor was there and still it was spreading, then what do you do at that time? Now, if Ram had tried to crush that rumor, <coughs> all that would have happened is people would say, you are so attached, you are abusing your power to crush this rumor. So, it's, it's, when rumors come, it's very difficult to understand which course of action to follow at that time. So, Ram did what was best at that time and further reasons for that, I will explain in the second part of the talk. Okay. Yeah. I liked your example about um, you know the fire. You try to contain it somewhere, and then it goes somewhere else. Yeah. Um, I've kind of realized, like you know, that like you know sometimes like you know movies are like this too. Like you know, you really want to watch it. You really want to watch it. So like uh, you just can't contain. Like all right, I'm 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 not going to do it because like the mind's going to go crazy. So sometimes you got to find like different ways to kind of you know not be like just like too zombied out by it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, desires can also be like fire and you have to find out how best to deal with them. Thank you, yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, can we can we discuss at the end if you don't mind? So I want three four questions. Maybe one question will take. Yes, please. You had a question, I think. Yes, please. Sorry, sorry. I was just wondering, did Ron ever communicate and get permission from Sita to was there an agreement for her to be disbanded from the kingdom or at least sent away to Dalmatians? Yeah, okay. I'll come to that. I'll answer that a little later. Don't mind. I'll come to that. So now, uh, <coughs> if you see that third, I talked about two points. First was sacrifice. The second was yes. ethical dilemma. Now third I'm going to talk about is esoteric explanations. So esoteric explanations. See, everything that happens, we could frame it in different frames of reference. Say right now if you're sitting and this light go goes off, the chandelier light goes off. One possibility could be, oh, maybe there's a switch over there. Somebody leaned against the switch. Because of that, the chandelier light is going off. Hmm? Or maybe the chandelier, the power cable is damaged over there. Or you could say the power in the whole house has gone off. Or you could say maybe the power in the whole area has gone off. Or you could say, that America is attack, attacked by terrorists <laughs> and the power plants, all power plants are shut down over here. Or you could go further and you could say that uh, a solar flare has come from the sun and this is a real danger and there's nothing we can do about it. Solar flares are sudden surcharges of light and energy that come from the sun and if a solar flare comes sufficiently close to the earth, all electrical and electronic devices on all over the earth will shut down. So, you could say one switch, one, one light going off, you could extrapolate it to millions and millions of miles away, the sun having a solar flare. Now, which is right? There is no right or wrong in this. We have to see what works. Now, if a power goes off and I start worrying, is America attacked by terrorists? Don't be paranoid. Don't be paranoid. Paranoid are people who are, who are very afraid that everybody is hates me and everybody is out to target me. So if somebody just jumps to that level, oh America is attacked by terrorists, then that's paranoia. And paranoia is such that the paranoid people, uh, they just get the cause effect long. Paranoid people imagine that everybody hates me, everybody is out to get me. And then they say, everybody hates me because I am paranoid. <laughs> 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 Turn the cause effect around completely. <laughs> so what we need to do is, we have to find out in, in the most constructive frame of reference we put it. So the most constructive is, okay, look at the power. Okay, the power is, uh, uh, the switch is off, turn it on. Oh, let, let's replace this and see what happens. So rather, when we, which frame of reference we put it in, that will depend on what is most constructive. So the <coughs> incidents in our life, normally we put them in the frame of reference of immediate cause and effect. Say if I get cough, then I would say, okay, did I take anything cold recently? If I didn't take anything cold recently, is the weather cold? If that is not the case, then okay, did I, was I in touch with somebody who had cough and I got the infection from them? Or is there a, virus in the area, is there epidemic going on? So I have to find out in which frame of reference I put it. So similarly, so when, when some things happen, see when there is, this is the, when B has happened, and we want to try to, try to, we want to find a cause for it. So we try to put it in the immediate frame of reference. But when it doesn't make, when the immediate frame of reference doesn't make sense, then we need to put in the bigger frame of reference. And in a still bigger frame of reference to see in what frame of reference things make sense. So as several of you pointed out, that in terms of the, the size of the rumor and the size of the response to it, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It is, it is such an unsubstantiated rumor and such a big response to that. But we see that 
that's how life is sometimes you know it happens sometimes that nowadays is social media available you know people take one photo of someone in some context and then that photo goes viral oh this person is like this this person is like that and then there's one misconception <coughs> which can grow so fast it is said that you know a falsehood in today's world can spread across the world before truth can even put on the coat to go out <laughs> so that's how sometimes things are <coughs> <coughs> So the way it is that the cause A, so the principle of karma is that actions lead to reactions. But one point of karma is that it is not always one-to-one -one correspondence. One-to-one -one correspondence means the magnitude of the action and the magnitude of reaction may not always be the same. Uh, and it, we, we see it all the time. You know, so imagine three people are walking along a road and the, all three of them chatting and they don't notice that there is some puddle of water over there or some water has spilled over there all three of them slip now one of them slips and they are near a wall so they catch hold of the some pipe near the wall and steady themselves the other person slips and behind uh, and there is behind them there is mud and they slip and fall on the mud now nothing is hurt except their pride <laughs> the third person slips and falls and there is a sharp stone behind them and their head hits the stone and they get brain hemorrhage. Now all three of them you could say that they all their mistake was similar all three of them were inattentive while walking but the what happened to all three of them was very different. Why is that? This is where if you just put it in the immediate frame of reference it doesn't make sense you, know, you slip and you get brain hemorrhage it's ridiculous. So then you have to put it in the bigger frame of reference that the reactions that we get to our actions are not just the reaction to those actions that is past karma also comes in sometimes. So when the immediate frame of reference doesn't make sense then you have to put it in the bigger frame of reference. When the power switch is still on but still the light has gone off then we put it in the bigger frame of reference. So similarly the Ramayana puts things in bigger frame of reference and talks about previous lives or so he, it says that the, the Ramayana Valmiki Ramayana tells the story that there was a very powerful demon who was terrorizing the universe and and he was terrorizing the universe finally the devtas were very troubled by the demon they went to Vishnu and then Vishnu uh, finally he came and Vishnu, Vishnu started chasing the demon and the demon started running 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 Vishnu was chasing, closing in on him and finally this demon passed by the hermitage of Bhrugurushi. Bhrugu is a very powerful sage and he just ran into the hermitage and there was Bhrugurushi's wife, she was like a matronly lady and he says, please save me, please save me, people are coming to kill me over here and she, she was like a motherly mood and she felt this person has come and she normally, if somebody comes to us for protection, we give protection, she says, yes, I will give you shelter. And then Vishnu came over there, Vishnu looked around and saw that uh, he's here. Then he saw, so this was Bhrugu's wife Khyati. And he told Khyati that this is a terrible demon and uh, he has terrorized the universe for a long time and we need to, we need to kill him, otherwise he will continue to terrorize me. So she said no. She said no. I have given you shelter, you cannot touch him. He said no. When you gave him shelter, you did not know that he was a terrible demon. You did not know what all wrong he has done. He has killed so many people. He will continue killing so many people. After a long battle, we have found him, we have downed him and now we have to finish him. He says, no. No means no. So here we see an example of categorical ethics. I have given shelter and I will give shelter. No, but if you have given shelter, it's true if somebody comes to for say, say if shelter we can use shelter but who is that person if you come to know we can't just have the idea of rigid shelter so now that demon is a particular time in which he had to be killed and then Vishnu he told us you know that he is a he, said, he is an anti-social element you have to kill him sometimes what happens is that one of my friends is in the army so he was telling that many times militants well, militants what they do is 
that if they are being chased, they will they'll wreck and kill people and they'll flee and then they will rush into civilian areas. And sometimes they take civilians as hostages. And sometimes they just hide among the civilians. Now normally the police will try their best to try to separate the civilians from the criminals. But sometimes in the, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the police provide the facility for the civilian to go away from the to go away from the criminal, from the militants, but the civilians refuse to go away. But if the civilians start protecting the criminals, in some insurgent area, that's what happens. Then this is in military terminology, this is called collateral damage. Collateral damage is where they don't they want to kill only the aggressors, but while killing the aggressors, some other people get killed. So because Khyati in a misdirected way, with a, with a sense of misdirected compassion, she tried to protect, protect uh, this demon, so she became a victim of collateral damage. And then eventually the demon was killed. Now when Bhrugurushi came back, at that time he was infuriated when he heard that his wife had been, this had happened to him. He said, you, oh, you wish you? Because you have caused me to be separated from my wife, I curse you. That you will be separated from your wife. And that curse was the cause of the separation of Ram and Sita. So when Vishnu, Vishnu and Vishnu and Lakshmi in the spiritual world are always united. But when they come to the material world, that is the time when they have to be separated. And <clears throat> basically because of that curse Ram and Sita you could say were not destined to be together they were together for some time then they went to the forest and Ravan exiled them Ravan abducted her they got back so that separation was for a short time then Ram got Sita back but then again Ram and Sita were separated so it is not just because of that accusation that this happened that accusation gained a momentum of its own. Like sometimes some rumors just spread across the world and some rumors nobody cares for them. So why? It's very difficult to analyze. So we understand if a person gets hit by a widespread rumor, it's, a, it's sometimes past karma is coming in over there. So in this case it was like that. So there is an esoteric explanation going back to previous lives. Madhvacharya in his uh, Madhacharya has written a book called Mahabharata Tatpari Nirnay. Madhacharya is a very prominent Acharya in among the four prominent Acharyas of the Vaishnava Sampradayas. And he, in his Mahabharata Tatpari Nirnay, he also has a section of the Ramayana. And there he, he quotes another Puranic, another scriptural refer, traditional reference where he says that there is demon, who, the demons are very cunning. They somehow want to find some way by which they will, they will can avoid death. There was there's an American comedian who said, it's, I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> now it's not that you, are, you can go somewhere else, it's going to happen. In another person, another Greek philosopher says, when I am there, death will not be there. When death will be there, I will not be there. <laughs> Therefore, I will never die. <laughs> well, this is simply word jugglery. It doesn't happen like that. But the idea is that this demon, he thought, the demons are very cunning and try to get a way to uh, get a way to say, get uh, to try to be mortal. So he said that as long as Lakshmi and Narayan are united, let me never die. So then what happened was Ram and Sita had to be separated. And then when they were separated, Indra started fighting with the demon. Had a long, long, long fight, and finally Indra killed that demon. And when Indra killed that demon, that was the time Ram decided enough is enough. And they said Ram did call Sita back. Ram did not permanently reject her. Ram did call Sita back eventually. And <coughs> why did he call back? The rumor by that time had died down, and this demon had already been killed. But eventually, Sita at that time decided, let me end my, end my Leela over here. So she returned to the earth. So this is esoteric explanations. 
There are, so sometimes actions that we see, which seem unreasonable, outrageous, from this life's perspective, when you frame them in a bigger picture, they start making some sense. And the last is probably the most important. Last S is selflessness. Selflessness means that the Ramayan, the whole Ramayan has a particular mood. That mood is of not putting oneself first. Many people in today's world are eye specialists. <laughs> not eye specialists, eye specialists. <laughs> they, are, they are narcissists, obsessively self individualistic. In fact, the word, have you heard of the word narcissism? Yeah. So narcissism is self obsessed and it comes from a Greek story. There's a character named Narcissus. And he was very handsome and he was very proud of his attractiveness. So once he went by a river and he looked at his reflection, I am so attractive. He peered down more to look at himself more. Hey, so attractive. He looked peered down more. And he was on the coast of bank of a river and he peered down more, 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 till he toppled over. <laughs> and he didn't know how to swim, so he sank. <laughs> So narcissism is a is that comes from that story of narcissus that somebody who is so whose self obsession leads to self destruction. So people are self obsessed like that. Now, <coughs> in the, so if you see the opposite opposite of self obsession or self centeredness is selflessness, and the whole Ramayana's mood is the mood of selflessness. Although Dashrat loves his son, but in order to honor his word to, to Kaikai, he selflessly sends Ram away. Although Sita has no obligation to go with Ram, in fact, Ram tells her, Stay here. But Sita says, I will go with you. She is selfless. And even if you say Sita is married to Ram, so she has to go. Lakshman has no obligation to go. But Lakshman also goes. He is also selfless. When Lakshman, now when Bharat has got the kingdom in a platter, he could have said, I didn't conspire for it, I got it, let me use it. It's like, like most people, most people may not reasonably honest, they will not go and steal, say, uh, say a thousand dollars from a bank. But you're walking along the road, and say you're walking along the road and tree shakes and from the tree a wallet falls. And the wallet contains thousand dollars. <laughs> so destiny gave it to me, isn't it? <laughs> so say okay, let me keep it. Anything like that, isn't it? <laughs> so like that, with no effort, for Bharat, the kingdom fell in his lap. He did not do anything. But what did Bharat do? Bharat did not keep the kingdom. He went to Ram and he begged to Ram, please keep the kingdom. And finally, when Ram refused, then Bharat said. Please give me your slippers. They will rule. I want the I want the um, the king the position in the court to reflect the disposition in my heart. That in my heart you are my lord and I am your servant. So let these slippers be on the throne and I will sit on the humble seat beneath and I'll be your servant. Now. In India, there was one of the most well, one of the wealthiest businessmen. He passed away suddenly without uh, leaving a proper will. And his two sons, they got involved in such a bitter battle. It went on for months and months and months and years. So there's one Indian current historian has written a book about their battle. He calls it the modern Ramayana. But it is actually not the modern Ramayana. It's the antithesis of the modern Ramayana. Because, yes, there was a succession battle between Ram and Bharat. But the battle was not, I want the kingdom, I want the kingdom. He says, you take the kingdom, you take the kingdom. <laughs> so it's the complete opposite. And today, if one brother gave his slippers to the other brother, the other brother would take it and beat him. <laughs> so we see that the whole Ramayana is permeated with that mood of selflessness. And you see, most of the selflessness we can understand. 
just like when we study in a subject uh, the, uh, this class is going to come to a full circle now in the conclusion i started by saying how uh, some understanding builds on our existing understanding some understanding destroys our existing understanding so most of the examples of selflessness they build on our existing understanding yeah you know it's quite a, quite a difficult to be as selfless as bharat but still we understand it's laudable so there are examples of selflessness which rise higher and higher but the highest understanding of selflessness is of ram and sita that instead of thinking of ram as the as the victimizer and sita as the victim and that is that is a complete distortion of the reality sita is a very strong principled woman and later on in love and kush grow up at that time she never poisons them about her father about uh, their father and when they actually meet ram and uh, they meet ram and they are about to fight with ram she comes in between how can you fight with them there he is your father so although she is terribly hurt shattered in fact to be away from ram but she is not resentful of it or uh, there is this whole uh <clears throat> in many academic department there is gender studies and they try to recast the whole of history of humanity as a exploitation of women by men well that's that's completely untrue because it is not that throughout history men were in power and women were powerless actually throughout history there is a small number of men who had power and they dominated the remaining men and they dominated the remaining women also so it is a small some number and sometimes there are queens also who are dominated but it was so the whole recasting of history in fact there is one feminist who is said why should it be his story history it should be her story <laughs> so so the point is that yes there has been there has been some exploitation of women but everybody is exploited in life so the, the the attempt to see ramayan in that prism that oh ram is the victimizer and sita is the victim now sita has tremendous strength of character she does not treat herself as a victim normally victims get filled with bitterness she is never filled with bitterness she did not fill her sons with bitterness so the best example to understand ram and sita is to compare it with dashrath and ram when dashrath sent ram to the forest it was painful for dashrath and dashrath did it out of obligation and dashrath in one sense in that context he was heroic because he was sticking to his word of honor and ram was heroic because ram also gallantly agreed to that very difficult sentence that he got so so just as dashrath and ram are both very selfless in doing something very difficult which is painful to both of them so similarly ram and sita are also heroic in their own ways in doing something which is extremely difficult so ram is not the victimizer and sita the victim rather ram and sita are both cooperators in an act of extreme selflessness so as i said the earlier example of selflessness they build on our existing conception of selflessness but this radically challenges and crucial ones destroys our previous conception of selflessness so ram and ram sending sita where sita willing sita of course she was shattered but she eventually accepted she didn't resent it that shows her strength of character and the eternal lesson that people have drawn from the ramayan is this lesson of selflessness if you consider indian history uh, ramayan has inspired millions of people for millennia so even if you objectively consider indian history it, uh, it, now especially when you consider it with current western history we see the eastern countries like india have a strong family structure so if at the foundation of that had been such judgmental attitude towards one's family members now how would this family structure have survived so what the inspiration that people have drawn from the ramayan 
is not to be judgmental and on some unsubstantiated accusation send others away. The inspiration, the lesson that people for millennia have drawn is the inspiration for selflessness. So it is the selflessness that can actually truly sustain relationships. It is selflessness that can sustain communities. It is selflessness that can help us to grow spiritually. See, the ultimate selflessness is when we become selfless for Krishna. Initially, we are selfish, concerned only about ourselves. Then, as our selflessness grows, you know, say if we form a relationship with someone, we have to think about the other person. Then we have children, we think about them also. So, as our circle keeps growing, 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 ultimately, it is meant to grow to Krishna. So, the self is Krishna or Ram. So, the idea is that this Ramayana demonstrates selflessness. And that is the most important and enduring lesson. And if we learn the selflessness, then we all can become better human beings, you know, better, uh, better members of our family, better members of our community, better members of our country, better members of the world. So the Ramayana's enduring lesson is this extraordinary vision of selflessness, extraordinary inspiration to become selfless. Yesterday I talked about how Ram was selfless amidst distress, being concerned about others' distress, not his own distress. So that is the enduring lesson of the Ramayana. So Ram sent Sita away and uh, it was both of them participated in the great sacrifice of selflessness. And both of them are great heroes in being able to take up this very difficult exercise in selflessness. And that's why both of them are glorified. Sita is remembered not as somebody who was accused and sent away. Sita is remembered as an emblem of chastity and purity and devotion. So if that accusation had been in any way substantiated, substantial, then that would have scarred her memory, but that has not happened. Sita is also a great character, Ram is also a great character. And when we see this in the right perspective, we understand that this is all a part of a extraordinary teaching of selflessness. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke on the theme of why did Ram send Sita away? I started by talking about how education happens in two different ways. One is, say if you have a property, we can build on the existing property or we can destroy, blow up the existing property and reconstruct again. So education sometimes happens by building on our existing conceptions and sometimes by destroying our existing conceptions. So scripture also adopts both these strategies while teaching. Most of the Ramayana and its inspiring pastimes build on our existing conceptions. So the Ramayana you could say is like a, a typical romance story. But the conclusion has a completely shocking unexpected twist. Where the hero and heroine are supposed to be united and they happily ever after they get separated. So what's going on? So we could either say that these people are crazy. So we talked about is Shurpankha is Ravan an ideal brother? Not at all. He did not fight with Ram for Shurpankha's sake. He fought for Sita's because of lust for Sita, not love for Shurpankha. And is Ram a bad husband because he went away, sent Sita away? No, we discussed that using an acronym. What is the acronym? C's. C's. S was? Sacrifice. sacrifice. So the sacrifice means two things. First is that in the sacrifice, Ram had a effigy of Sita. It means he considered her pure. And secondly, the sacrifice also means that Ram, it was not just Sita who sacrificed by going away from Ram. Ram also sacrificed because he never remarried. So <clears throat> if he just was concerned about honor and wanted a picture perfect family, as a king without a king, is ha queen is hardly picture perfect. Then why did he send Sita away if he didn't consider her impure? I talked about E was? Ethical, ethical dilemma. dilemma. So I talked about contextual ethics and categorical ethics. That categorical is, this is always right no matter what. But contextual is, we have to look at the con uh, consequence, look at the overall time, place, circumstance, understand what is right and wrong. So Ram faced an ethical dilemma that as a king, he had to demonstrate detachment. And people were considering very attached to his wife, although she was suspected of something. And he had a duty to his wife, he had a duty to his kingdom. And he chose a duty to his kingdom, but he also did his duty to his wife by not exiling her right into the forest, but within his kingdom to Valmiki Ashram. So now why would he do such a thing still? So why? When the rumor was not credible, that sometimes 
even if a rumor is not credible it just spreads like wildfire and then what do you do sometimes uh, you just have to move away because the area is going to be burnt so when the cause of a connection doesn't make sense in our immediate context then we frame it in a bigger frame of reference that's why the second e was esoteric, esoteric explanations so i talk here about the principle of karma if uh, if a light goes off it could be because the power switch has gone off or it could be because terrorists have attacked america and our power plants have shut down so we have to frame it in the right scale of reference so yes that unsubstantiated accusation leading to sending away that doesn't make sense so we put in the bigger frame of reference i talked about two stories from the past one is khyati trying to protect the demon and she being the collateral dam becoming the collateral damage when vishnu had to kill the demon and um, bhrugumuni cursing vishnu that you will be separated from your wife and madhacharya telling the other story that this demon who could be killed only when ram and, when vishnu and narayan vishnu and lakshmi were separated so those were the reasons we could say when you scale, when you we expand the scale of reference and then last was selflessness. selflessness so we see that the sita did not become bitter and poison her sons about ram so rather than thinking of sita as a victim and ram as a victimizer trying to fit this into a gender discrimination narrative we we see it in the whole in the narrate in the in the narrative in which the whole ramayan is cast and that is the narrative of selflessness so mo, the selflessness of dasharatha and ram of Laksh, of lakshman of sita of bharat all these they are selflessness that we can understand they build on our existing understanding but the selflessness of ram and sita in being separated that is something which challenges our existing understanding so they the best example to understand it is the said dasharatha and ram dasharatha sent ram away to the forest similarly ram sent sita away to the forest and it is very painful and they did it out of obligation and both of them show enormous strength of character in doing this exercise of selflessness the enduring lesson of the ramayan which has sustained the stable family structure in india for millennia is not that become judgmental about others based on unsubstantiated accusations accusations it is be selfless in your relationship with others and that selflessness can help us today especially in today's narcissistic age in helping us to become better human beings better family members better members of our community and ultimately better devotees when we expand our selflessness to the lord thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna any questions yes sir So could it be said that the, why did the washerman or this person accuse uh, Sita like this? Was it because of the absence of the Lord? Yes, we could say that's the one reason. But then another way of looking at it is also that Bharat was there and Bharat was ruling virtuously, so Bharat did not become contaminated at all. So it's it's somehow very uh, puzzling at one level that even those who are very close to the Lord, uh, supposedly very close to the Lord, sometimes they turn against the Lord. so we see this in krishna leela also where when a particular jewel is stolen so the shamantak money is stolen and then some darkasis are start suspecting that krishna is behind this whole thing the krishna is the lord is protecting them from so many dangers so how does this happen even chaitanya mahaprabhu you are so glorious but other brahmins could not understand they criticized him so there are sometimes Uh, certain things which happen which are meant to demonstrate that this in this world the nature of the world is that uh, 
we will all get criticized, we will all get accused. It is just the way the world is. I was going for a program, I saw a, a quote on like some people put some stickers, bumper stickers. So it said, the more I get to know people, the more I love my dog. <laughs> there, was a, there was a Western philosopher, he was an atheist, so he was asked, do you believe in hell? She said, of course. What? I said, well, if he's an atheist, how do they believe in hell? She says, hell means other people. <laughs> now, that was his conception. Now, it's not, now, this is universally true. But the point is, in all our lives, we will, in the lives of every one of us, we will find that there are some people who turn against us for no fault of ours. Some, why does it happen? It happens with everyone. Some people, some people they like us sometimes for no reason, of, no reason. And some people they hate us for no reason. So why does it happen? It's just the nature of the world. Bhutana yen mithaha kali. Like, uh, the, in the Kunti Bahana Express, they said that conflicts happen because of the, because of the mutual interactions between people. So, so when the, uh, in some ways, or uh, the Lord himself is transcendental, but when he descends to this world, he does demonstrate that he also goes through many of the tribulations that we go through. So, sometimes through people, we do get, uh, people do get uh, somehow turn against us and that's what happened, that's what happened over there also. Yes, please. I just uh, thought coming through, you know, when Rama was presenting uh, an exemplary example of sending Sita away as an act of selflessness, but those people are not, are not that educated, that's the washerman. They may take that, take it as a, hey, see that Rama banished his wife, I'm going to banish you also. Yeah, that's possible, but we, there's no evidence. You know, if you look at the history of India, there's no history, there's not much evidence, broadly speaking. If you talk about, there are many historians who are quite leftist and they have a lot of uh, bias against what they call as the Brahminical culture, the Brahminical patriarchy. But even they have not been able to find much evidence that Indian men were so judgmental about their wives that they send them away on just unsubstantiated accusations. That, that can possibly happen, but that hasn't happened. And in general, when, we te when scripture teaches something, see, the, the broad principle is that scripture teaches through extreme examples. And in, so those extreme examples are meant to be like memorable lessons for certain pr universal principles. They are not meant to be the standards. So this applies both ways. So if we see Ajamil, he was, um, he, he got carried away with a prostitute and then finally he chanted the name of Narayan and he was saved by that. So now this story is broadly known in the Indian tradition, but how many people because of that have started thinking that, you know, I can do sinful activities and still I chant the holy names. That is not the mood. See, the extreme examples are always extreme. And they are meant to, in an extraordinary way, demonstrate a universal principle. So the extreme examples are never to be standardized. So that standardization has not ha happened. See that the, Ra the Ramayan tradition has had a has had a, it's, it's hundreds and hundreds of saints have commented on the Ramayana also. You know, even now, at least we have 50, 60 commentaries of the Ramayana available, despite all the destruction of books that happened during the Islamic invasion of India, and also destruction that happened because the Indian weather is not very conducive for keeping a leaf or paper or anything. So it is very difficult to preserve books. But still, you see these commentators, none of them has recommended this particular thing, you do everything, all of you should do like this. So that hasn't, that can happen, but every ethos, every scripture has a particular mood and a particular stress. So what is stressed in the book and what is stressed by the teachers of the book, that is what is primarily lived by the people. So the, the lesson that has been stressed throughout is selflessness. That is considered like an extraordinary act, which shows the greatness of Ram's character and Sita's character also. But that is not considered to be like a standard action that everybody has to do. At, not at all. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, when 
many years passed and she had a baby and everything. But we never even checked one time how she's doing. She's a lady in, alone in the jungle. Like anything can happen to her. Yeah, of course he's with somebody here, wrapped around him, she's safe. But even the family too, anything can happen. Why she runs? Yeah. Generally, that is the meaning of exile, that there is no contact. So although technically Ram did not send Sita on exile, or you could, but, but it was like an exile. So basically, the idea was he cut off all contact with her. Yeah, but as a husband, he had, he had responsibility, he's a big king, he had to take care of all the people. But as a husband, he had responsibility too. He got married to Sita Mata, and he should, he should be at least once he checked it, how she was doing. Yeah, so that is, see, the thing over here is that, that's true, I agree with you. No, the cha as I said, the challenge over here is that Ram is the king, and the king, he is in a very visible position. The whole point of the accusation was that he is so attached. So, if he goes and meets her, he inquires about her, that will only vindicate the accusation of attachment. So he has to visibly put a distance between himself and her. See, the context over there is very different from today's context. So in that, co in today's context, it's become very difficult to make sense of what uh, what was done over there. But in that context, if you see, there are others also. It is not that the if you look at the overall context of Ramayan. You see there are other saintly people were there, other people, sages were there. And whenever Ram is about to do some action, he consults them and he discusses with them. So this is something which in that context, that was the only way he had to demonstrate detachment. And detachment means no contact. So he's attached with all the people who came to He's attached with all the people in the city he was living, he checked off everybody. That's that's the whole point. The point is that it is the opposite of the normal conception where see, the idea is that if I am most attached to the people who are more connected with me and I am less attached to people less connected with me. But Ram's selflessness is that he demonstrated that I am more concerned about the people who are less concerned about me. So, so the whole idea is that he is demonstrating an extraordinary level of selflessness. Yes, there's a question. You had a question? Remember the end of the story of uh, Vishnu, you know, came the demon and Kyati, when, when she was under the question of Kyati and Dibhumani curses Lord Vishnu. So on one hand we say Lord is supreme and transcendental. How do we understand it coming, you know, explaining okay. a cycle like karmic reaction from the demon to the life of Okay, good question, yeah. So how can the Lord be cursed by someone? So generally, the Lord is not bound by anyone's curse. But he voluntarily accepts the power of the Brahmanas. It, it's, there are, there are, you could say that there is a law of karma. And there are, there are different understandings. Are the devatas under the law of karma? Well, not exactly the same way as human beings. In the sense that... Now the devatas, they have prosperity and they have phenomenal prosperity. So the devatas have apsaras with them, big prosperity and they can enjoy over there. But devatas are also accountable for their actions. When devatas offend the brahmanas, they also have to suffer. So the idea is the Lord, when he descends, he does not necessarily disrupt the natural order of things. So the natural order of things is somebody is cursed. The Lord doesn't have to accept the curse. But he accepts the curse out of deference for the Brahmanas. So that's how it's so you could say that just as the Lord is not, you know, he is not always acting as God. If he is always acting as God, he could already say that I know this Maricha, this is this deer is not a real deer. There is no good need to chase after it. Then Sita would never be abducted, isn't it? Or if he is God, when he is fighting with Ravan, you know, he is present as the Paramatma in the Ravan's heart. They could just give Ravana a heart attack from inside. <laughs> <laughs> so says, he doesn't always manifest his divinity when he is there in this world. Okay, thank you. Yes, one.
इस माता जी है ओके What this is? What? Okay. And uh, there, um, we heard that uh, without the So okay, why is, how is that Agni Pariksha justified? Mm, Agni Pariksha was when Sita went through fire. <coughs> yeah, that is something which even Lakshman couldn't digest, he said. So she is pure, why, how do you have to challenge her for that? But Ram was very stern at that time. So I would say that there are some actions for which there is no immediate explanation. There is an esoteric explanation only. The esoteric explanation was that uh, it was not Sita, but it is Maya Sita. That is when Lakshman put the Lakshman Rekha around Sita when he went away. The Lakshman Rekha is a protective mystical circle. And anybody who comes in that circle, on that circle, steps on it, the fire will come in. So Ravan couldn't enter into it. But when Sita came out, because Ravan said, uh, Ravan came in the garb of a mendicant and he asked. So when Sita stepped over it, at that time Sita went into the fire and Maya Sita who was a yogini named Vedavati. She came back. And Ravan actually abducted Maya Sita. And then uh, Sita went to Agni Dev and stayed with Agni Dev. And then when the Agni Pariksha was done, at that time, Vedavati went back to Agni Dev and the real Sita came back. So the Agni Pariksha from an external perspective was a test of purity for Sita. But essentially, it was uh, uh, the return of the real Sita. And what is the second question you mentioned? Uh, did, uh, did Sita ji take the okay. So when, when Ram was to go to the forest, did Sita take the initiative? And was that right according to scripture? Yes. See, Ram was selfless and he was concerned. Sita is a princess. She has lived in the royalty. So how can she come to the forest with him? So he dissuaded her quite strongly. In fact, he, in a sense, presumed that she would not, that you stay here and you uh, take care of my, uh, you serve my parents. And he even gave her instruction, don't glorify me in front of Bharat. Because Anna said that will cause envy. So then she said, what do you mean? I'm going to come with you. She says, no, the forest is no place for a lady like you. You stay here. Then she spoke a lot about the dangers of the forest. And then she says, no, but if you are with me, I am safe. She says, no, it's no place for you. And finally, she uses the last resort. Last resort she says, I'm so unfortunate that my father gave my hand in marriage to a man who cannot protect me in a forest. <laughs> and now, although it was like an attack on Ram's manliness, but Ram saw it in the intention it was. Ram said that, actually, I would love for you to come with me. You know, your company will be a great solace for me in the forest. But I didn't want to put you to the discomfort that has come upon me. And I was not sure how eager was your desire. So when she spoke this, I said, now I know you really want to come with me. So then, and then, she, and then they went together. So Ram was, as I said, concerned about others. She felt Sita should not be subject to that discomfort. But Sita wanted to be with Ram. She felt it was her duty as a wife to be with her husband in, through thick and thin. <clears throat> so, now as far as scriptural, what is right or what is wrong? In general, the scriptural idea is that the husband should always be, the wife, the husband and wife should be together. The wife should always be by the side of the husband. 
So it was right for Sita to be with Ram. But in fact, say Ram is, uh, you could say Ram was being a little contextually ethical. Because Ram just came after meeting Kaushalya. And he told Kaushalya, the duty of a wife is to be with her husband. <laughs> <laughs> and Kaushalya wanted to come with him. He told her, don't come. But then he spoke to Sita, you stay over here. So why was it like that? It was not that he was talking about two duties, uh, but rather he was concerned about others' comfort. He felt that it was for Kaushalya to come away with him, that would be very great distress for Dashrath. If he had to come with him, that would be great distress for her. So it was more of a test from him. And also his default disposition was that to not cause discomfort to others. So see, Sita, it, it actually shows the intensity of Sita's, uh, Sita, how she was such an exemplary, uh, exemplary, dedicated, committed wife. So that's quite extraordinary that she took the initiative over there at that time. No, during that time Ram didn't tell her and it was Lakshman who told her. So Lakshman often gets the uh, difficult task to do. <laughs> That's why Lakshman said next time I'm going to be the older brother. <laughs> he came as Balram thereafter. So Yoga Vashishtha sounds very much like Advaita philosophy. How do you understand it? Was it delivered by Ram to by Vashishtha to Ram? See what has happened is that uh, many scriptural narratives have been adopted by other traditions also. The Ram, the Ram, if you look at the Ramayana itself, it is clearly a bhakti text. Ramayana is not it's not denying other schools of thought. Even the Mahabharat, when they go to the forest, they meet Shaivites, they meet uh, worshippers of the goddess, they may, and they respect all the sages, Pandavas. But the Pandavas themselves are Vaishnavas. So similarly, Ram also goes to Shiva temples and he respects Lord Shiva because he's playing a man, human role, so he worships the gods. But it's clear overall that it's a personal text. But subsequently, because the Ramayana is so popular, that then other traditions have also tried to uh, use the popularity of the Ramayana for their purposes. In fact, there is a, there is a whole book called the Jain Ramayana. And what is the Jain Ramayana? It is more or less the same story of the Ramayana, but when Ram goes to the forest, throughout he keeps meeting Jain Sadhus. <laughs> <laughs> and Jain Sadhus, Jain saints, and they keep giving him, uh, giving him instruction. And that end is that at the end of the Ramayana, Ram becomes detached and becomes an enlightened Jain. <laughs> so there is something called uh, like the uh, mis that you could say called the the appropriation of the tradition by others. It happens in all in all in many religions. It happens like in the European tradition. Uh, the Greek thinkers, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle were considered very great thinkers. So Christianity came later and Christianity adopted a lot of the, the Bible doesn't contain much philosophy. It has more stories. So Christians needed some philosophy. So they integrated the Greek thinkers philosophy with the biblical storyline. Now when they are doing that, now, now Socrates, Plato, Aristotle were not Greek, Christians. But somehow now in many, many medieval or ancient churches, you will see uh, all three of them being portrayed as Christians. And they say they were they are pre-Christ Christians. <laughs> so this kind of appropriation of tradition always happens. So my understanding is Vashishtha is a character. Of course, he's a great sage and he is there very much in the Ramayana. But that particular instruction being given and being attributed to Vashishta as, uh, as being given. That is a later historical reconstruction that has been associated with the Ramayana. 
So the Ramayana is not a personal, Ramayana is a personal text, it's not an Advaitic text. But that particular thing is something which the Advaitic tradition has, uh, has you could say, this is sometime in the broad Indian tradition there is, there is this whole character that sometimes, whole concept that sometimes historical characters may be cast in non-historical roles. So, in the Natak Chandrika, Rupa Goswami says that when you write a Natak, write a drama, you can have three kinds of characters. You can have historical characters, non-historical characters, that non-historical means fictional characters you could say and third is historical characters in non-historical contexts. So, like Prabhupada tells the story of once a person, he knew that he was going to die, the astrologer told him, so he said, you know, Yam Yamdraj will come to kill me, uh, take me. So, he went and uh, he said, you know, I will, how can I escape death? So, he got a crazy idea. So, he went in the place where people would pass, uh, pass refuse and he covered his whole body with human excreta. And he thought, if I am so stinky and so smelling, Yam Yamaraj will not come. <laughs> and then, he says, uh, the Yamaraj came as a hog, licked his whole body and then took him away. <laughs> now, did Yamaraj really come as a hog? Well, Prabhupada tells the story, but Prabhupada doesn't give any reference to the Puranas for that story. So, you could say, the, the point of the story is not that Yamaraj came as a hog. The point is that death, Prabhupada also tells the story to extra, emphasize that death can't be avoided. So, sometimes, some some historical characters might be put in non-historical contexts to illustrate some points. So, the Yoga Vashishta in my understanding is like that, that it's a, it's a historical character Vashishta, it's a historical character Ram, but they are put in a non-historical context to, to depict the, the teaching of Advaita Vada. Thank you. So, are there any other questions we can talk personally? Mm, thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada ki, Shri Ramachandra Bhagwan ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Tai Gaur Premanande.